about Okay, right. And why, why, is, why is the host not working? Concentrate for just a few minutes. It's not going to take very long. Some of this is so a little bit related to what you, um, some of you would have done a year or two back in um, IT Services Management, but at a, a higher level because we now want to look at the, the, the whole thing together in terms of project uh, management, in terms of risk management and benefits management. There's sort of three ways of actually looking at kind of making things work. So I'm going to go back to you thinking about the Zachman Enterprise architecture, which some of you will remember vaguely. Some of you probably forgotten all about it, and some of you actually haven't touched on it yet. Um, so that kind of positions of sustainable information corporate governance and the BSCIT <coughs> in contrast with many other um, of our programs around uh, Derby University. And then I want to look, so we won't bother about that one for the moment, but we'll then move on into project management, what it's about, uh, and then think a little bit about uncertainty management and benefits management and risk management. Because we know from the Standish Group um, project, the reports, those chaos reports that come out year after year, we still are almost incapable of delivering many successful IT related projects. The success rate in defined very tightly in terms of on time to budget and meet, <coughs> meeting all the um, contractual criteria for the project that were signed up at the beginning as success, about 30-35% of projects are successful in those terms. And it's been like that for the last very nearly 20 years. And a big chunk of projects which always fail, they never go anywhere, they never get implemented, and that's kind of bumbled along at about somewhere from 30% down to about 20-25%. The middle stuff the so-called challenge projects are kind of interesting. They're the ones which are defined as being late and or over budget and or not delivering um, all of the signed for functionality. And that, I mean, typically they are 40, 50, 60% over budget. They're 40, 50, 60% late. Uh, and they typically deliver only about 40% of the signed for uh, functionality stuff that's really necessary but isn't delivered. And we're still delivering something along the lines of 50 to 60 percent of all projects using IT are challenged. An astounding waste of time, resources and money. And if you haven't come across the Standish Group reports, go find some. There's a whole load of resources, um, I think on this module, but certainly there if it isn't on here, I can put it here for those guys who've not come across the standards group so far. And I've got copies of many of the reports that have popped out every couple of years or so. And it really is very interesting, it's very salutary to realise that we have learned almost nothing about making IT related projects more effective in 20 odd years. But then again, maybe other Industries have learned very little, um, as we see that many very large projects, whether it's military projects, procurement projects, civil uh, engineering projects, bridges, buildings, and so on, they're always, almost always late and over budget as well. So maybe it's not just IT, maybe it's a problem to do with project management itself. And yeah, there are many, dozens of different project management and um, program management uh, theories and processes and ideas, whether it's PRINCE2, uh, SSADM, PMBOK, etc, etc, etc. Maybe there's a fundamental issue with all of these project management kind of ideas and toolkits. <coughs> now, how many of you have come across Bruce Schneier? Those doing IT services management a year or two back might remember him as the leading proponent or expert on security, IT security. 
He has some very, very interesting articles on his website, www.schneier.com. And there's some really interesting articles he's written about how, as humans, we are or are not capable of actually identifying risk very effectively. We don't really understand how risk works. And whilst we are quite good at a gut level, gut feel level, you know, if we're out walking or somewhere and a bull chases us, we could see you know, something that's really viscerally related to us and we run like the clappers. Because you know, there's a 95% probability it's going to catch us before we fight into the hedge to jump over. So we go very, very fast. But what we're not very good at is coping with very small probability events which have high impact. So as a very, very current topic, think about what happened Friday, Saturday in Paris. Extraordinarily high impact, 100, 200 people killed in two or three different areas. And the probability of that happening in most parts of the country, in Britain, most parts of France, actually quite small. Think about the aircraft that fell out of the sky over from having taken off from Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah, high impact. One aircraft blown up or something that crashed. A few months before, a year or so back before that, that um, Malaysian Airlines going over the, sort of, going to Beijing or to China and it vanishes and turns up, hasn't yet turned up. Little aircraft falling out of the sky in bad weather over Dorset over the weekend, four people killed. Death hits us and yet ultimately, until now certainly, air travel is still probably the safest form of air travel. And those of us who've traveled regularly have always seen somewhere around us someone who is scared of travel and is holding so tightly that you can see all their tendons as they bump like that, or taking off, or landing. And hang on. There are millions and millions of takeoffs and landings, millions and millions of aircraft that fly through turbulence every day. And it's safe, and yet people don't feel that. They are truly, truly scared. Because we can't associate the statistic of one in 10, 20 million of something really bad happening with, that must mean I'm okay today. Just going through. Because planes don't fall out of the sky when they're bouncing in turbulence. It doesn't really matter how big it is. Even if you're cup of coffee bounces off the ceiling, you're actually safe. Even if you have a lightning strike on the aircraft. We don't know of any aircraft which have been knocked out of the sky in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Very, very small probability, but very high impact. And when we look at things like project management, there's lots and lots of things with very high impact but quite low probability, and we can't actually cope with that effectively. Game theory says you multiply, and project management and risk management theory says you multiply the probability of something happening by the size of its impact, and that gives you some sort of mechanism for understanding. But we aren't capable of doing that well. And that's really what Bruce Schneier's articles are, are about on this one. We're bad at risk assessment, and we're bad at risk management. There's another author called Daniel Kahneman, who's written an amazing book called Thinking Fast and Slow. He's interesting because he wrote a book, uh, or wrote that book, based and eventually got himself a Nobel Prize for economics. The only interesting thing is he's not an economist. He's actually a psychologist. And what he did was to look at how classical e economics uh, has a, an object in it called the rational person that defines that all economic decisions are taken by rational analysis, 
using proper mathematics and probability theory and so on, just like we do with risk management. And he realized from his own experience uh, as an academic that actually we don't do that very well. That actually most economic decisions, whether it's buying and selling stocks and shares, buying and selling you know, second-hand items in a fair, we don't actually apply rational decision theory. We actually wait, use a lot of shortcuts which don't really take account of the realities and the real facts. We also don't understand properly and don't take account of in the proper way that those, the rational approach, we make decisions in all sorts of funny ways. He also came up with things like uh, a whole series of fallacies which he writes about in his book. The planning fallacy, we know that we, yeah, we kind of in the background know the Standish Group theories and the Standish Group reports of success rates and so on. And yet as we plan our projects, we know that we're going to be successful. So we are not going to be part of the 70% of unsuccessful or challenged projects. We are going to be one of the successful ones. In spite of the fact there's only 30% probability that we will be a successful uh, project. And some of the statistics are even more exciting out of Standard Group that no project bigger than a $10 million budget or three or four, five man years worth of work are going to be successful. We will be challenged. There is no, ch over the 20 odd years, there are almost, if any, no projects over that $10 million budget size which have been successful by on time to budget and by quality. And he actually, out of his own experience, uh, gives a, an example when he and several colleagues, when they were working in Israel, had been commissioned to write a new curriculum for something or other. And, okay, right guys, let's, oh, we'll do it in two years or something. And they came up with this. And then it only struck him a little bit later that, hang on, have any of us in our own experience ever been able to deliver a project like this, with a team like this, in that two year sort of time scale? And I suddenly realized, no, we've never, no one has ever done that. They've all started off with the two years, but always achieved three or four years, or no, not at all. And there's a whole series of other sort of related fallacies where human beings kind of at the back of their mind know the statistics and yet don't apply them to our own projects. We are going to be successful. <coughs> and so it gets really very interesting. We start applying some of the stuff from Schneier, from Daniel Kahneman and quite a few others that says actually the whole of this, which is, again, ISO 27000 series, is based on risk assessment, risk management, mitigation, all those are good theories. You know, the stuff you learn as a Project 2 um, certified project manager. Great in theory, but remarkably little evidence it actually is successful most of the time. And so we need to think much more about are there other ways of ensuring we can deliver on time if we change our approach, or do we actually take account of the fact that we are always too optimistic, whether it's at the sponsor level, the guy who's paying for the project, and from a business perspective, it has to be done in this amount of time with all of these facilities, and I want all of it delivered. And yes, I know it's a challenging target, but that, no, it's good to give people challenging targets, it's a theory. And yet, most of the evidence is it never, ever works. No, that's not working. It wanted to update something. <coughs> now, just to get a recap, for those of you who can't remember what happened back in the second year or weren't there at all. BSCIT, this is the programme that we're finishing off this year, is very neatly characterised by the Zachman Enterprise Architecture at the top two levels. 
And IT services management, which is the second thing we do, is very, very much concerned about the perspectives from the guy who's the planner and the person who is the owner. Well, and that services management and also sustainable information corporate governance is very much at the very, very highest level. Where are we trying to go, why are we trying to go there, and a few other things. But as we go deeper into the technology, how the ap application is going to work, how it's going to look, how the user is going to use it, we're moving down to the second middle tier of uh, capability, as uh, Appen Enterprise Architecture. And if we look at the broad picture, there are six columns um, with various titles, but the most important ones are the what, how, where, who, where, when, or who, when, why. These are the six questions which allow you to really understand almost everything about a project. Um, there's one more, how much, which you could add in there as well. But in general terms, who, how, where, why, when, what, are the critical questions. And then you've got different perspectives from the very, very broad, very top level. What's the scope of the project? What's it intended to achieve? Uh, right the way down to the very bottom levels, which is computer science, is all down here. Now, the technology is involved. The coding, the database structure, should we use uh, a SQL database or a NoSQL database, a column database, a row database? whatever, or unstructured. And those are some of the questions that come into EITPD, where you're typically looking at flat files or structures, certainly no need for complex SQL type relational tables and so on. That's not what we're looking for. So we're basically, corporate governance typically is going to be at these levels, and much of where the problems arise in IT related projects and other projects is over optimism, the planning fallacy from Daniel Kahneman happening up at that level, to misunderstandings about the technology capabilities, um, the fact that humans don't remember terribly well what's necessary, what they do, and so that leads to requirements analysis, which sort of ricochet comes down here. Again, it's wrong, leading to late changes. Sometimes, um, even at this level, the why or the when question is sometimes um, obfuscated so that the salesman, the technical salesman, who is dealing uh, closely with the customer, realizes that the due date is actually, let's say, um, Mar end of March 2017. And unfortunately, the reality that's been communicated by that technical salesman is the project term, which is end of June 2017. <coughs> And it made that gap in timing maybe hidden for quite a long time if the communication is not very good. And suddenly, when the reality of not end of June 2017, but end of March 2017, the world kind of falls in and all oh, this whole program shuffles around. People lose jobs and so on. It happens regularly for all sorts of reasons. And so this is actually tends to be quite an interesting way of actually understanding what we should be looking for in terms of project, program, uh, management. And you know, there's risks all the way through all of these layers. And the classical project management approach that most project managers learn about is, OK, identify where the risks are. How likely are they? It might be done on a course green, amber, red sort of pro approach, or it might be A, B, C, D, or E, or something. All sorts of different ways to kind of give relative levels of risk, relative levels of impact. But we just have those, and we can't keep adding to them, and occasionally we cross one off the top as we kind of hope that we solve the problem. Not much actually seems to happen. So a few thoughts about what we're trying to do in terms of you know, the, the, sort of the broader approach that we're looking at in terms of BSCIT, the informatics, and project management. <coughs> we're looking at the design. We're looking at the timescales, the schedules. We're not actually involved in the details of the building where a lot of the problems actually end up. 
because we've done the wrong things in our overall design. We've got the wrong schedules, we've got the wrong resource allocation, etc. 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 And I see the three of you who've got real world experience, I guess you as well, are kind of nodding saying, yeah, we've seen that, haven't you? Seen all these problems happening. Yeah. I've seen it in many, many areas. We are interested in sort of the interface and we're interested in how it looks, the user interface, and how many times does the user interface end up as really pretty rubbish. So the focus of this project management thing we're looking at at the moment, program which is a collection of projects perhaps we're looking at getting things planned, getting them executed. And what goes on down there, well, we've got lower level project managers who work, or resource managers who are handling all the individual detailed tasks with the individual detailed technologists and so on. And what the project and the program managers have to do is to think about over the whole thing optimizing, not maximizing anything, but optimizing all of the benefits, the quality, the cost, resources, time, risk. It's an optimization game. We're not trying to maximize all of them because that's going to be impossible. So what I want you to do um, for a few minutes will be to look for definitions on program management and project management because they are different. And you will see adverts of program managers who have a much higher salary than project managers. So why is that? What is going to be the impact of that on your uh, assignment? I want you to find out what are the fundamental differences between projects and programs? What are the key tasks at a high level? Not a fine detail, but what are the major roles and responsibility of project manager versus a program manager, because that comes down to the definition of project versus program. And what I want you to do is to find out, or find, five different approaches to project management. In other words, you know, you'll find the major uh, def definitions of different styles of project management. <laughs> and <coughs> I suggest you use Wikipedia initially to get a brief overview, to get an idea of what the different styles are, different approaches to project management, and then follow up any of the links in the references, or then go into academic uh, type sources and professional sources. And then what you need to do that after that is this critical evaluation. The different the important differences, finding out the types of circumstance in which each of those different approaches might or might not work, and how would you choose between those five different project management approaches to choose the right one or a good one for a particular project that you're doing in your assignment, say or in real world. Now, then I want you to move on to looking for articles and information about risk management, benefits management, and uncertainty management. These are three completely and very fundamentally different ways of managing a project. Rather than saying, here's a risk and we don't really know what it is, but it's small, medium, or large, it's more to do with where are the areas of uncertainty in our project and maybe we concentrate our resources on trying to reduce the uncertainty we have about some particular area. And benefits management it takes a view, well, I don't actually care whether it delivers all of the functionality, but what I do want to do is to deliver those parts of the project which really make the maximize the benefits for my users, or for my company, or whoever, or my customers, or suppliers, whatever. And that leads on to the final little part, which is, right, pull the whole thing together. Compare those three fundamentally different approaches, risk, benefits, and uncertainty management. What are the strengths of each of them? What are the weaknesses of each of them? And 
do any of them deliver really interesting opportunities? And do actually they have some actual threats? They actually might make things worse. And there's a couple of books in the bibliography at the end, um, which are in the library. One on yeah, the fact that risk management is broken. That goes back to 2009. Why it's broken, some suggestions on how to fix it. And then this article, or this book here, about um, project opportunity, risk, and uncertainty management. So these are the sort of things I want you to be thinking about that you want to almost certainly need to build into your um, assignment because that's how you get successful or might be more successful than the Standish Group uh, type of approach um, suggests uh, or we are not very good at. Okay, so that's what I want to do now and then after this um, from about three o'clock